Travis. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Travis. I am an intern for emergency management. Uh, a little bit about my background. I go to Paul Smith College for disaster management and response. Um, I've been a firefighter for a few years as well. That's kind of what got me into this background. Um, I'm really enjoying it, learning as much as I can about the whole uh, service. Um, yeah, I'd like to just share as much as I've learned so far with all of you and what you should be doing during a disaster. That's it. <laughs> all right. So, my question for all of you, what is the, well, do you remember the last time that the power went out on you? What did you do? Open up to all of you guys. <laughs> if you stayed in your room, do you remember how long it went out for? Anything like that. Okay. Stayed in bed? Do you remember how long the power went out for? How long did it go out for? We have something major to go out for a few days, a few weeks, you never know. Having a plan to know what to do during that is very important. So, move right into it. If it'll work. Examples of man made disasters that we have uh, preventable fires, uh, terrorism, dam failure, structural collapse, transportation accidents, uh, manufacturing accidents, and active shooter events. Um, a lot of these can be prevented and are done by man made. Ones that are a little bit more difficult, so technical and cyber security threats, are communication failure, transportation failure, nuclear plant failure, power outage, and water system failure. Power outage is a huge one around here that can knock us down for a few days, especially for emergency management and emergency services. We can struggle with that for days. Lack of communication between departments can be huge. Um, they're unable to get supplies to where it needs to go. That's another big one. 
So Ulster County is separated into five different battalions. So it's separated as each one has a battalion chief who's in charge of that battalion. So they can kind of separate it and manage it a little bit easier. Um, so 911 calls for service just in the year of 2022. Law enforcement had 36,211 calls. That's for the whole year. Just for the few amount of dispatchers that are up there, they cycle through calls all day. What, for the county? Yes, ma'am. So for law enforcement, uh, so for fire, it was 13,965, and the EMS calls was 17,335. So going through the whole total, 52,645 calls for the whole year. And that's all just for Ulster County. Every call is coming through Ulster County and being sent to whatever town, which every day you're getting a huge amount of calls and these people are getting overwhelmed with calls, which is a lot for Ulster County. So why do we prepare? Um, our population is 181,000. Um, so our worst disaster that we suffered through was Hurricane Irene in August 27, 2011, knocked out almost majority of the county, the power, transportation, flooding everywhere. Um, and do you guys know what the number one hazard is in Ulster County? Good answer, flooding is the number one. So there's 85 different response agencies all throughout the county. Uh, there's 18 different police departments, 48 fire departments, and 17 EMS departments. Yep, and then flooding followed by wildfire, cyber attack, and hazardous material and transit. So major car accidents that get knocked over, can go into water systems, can go into buildings, towns, it can go wherever, whatever they're carrying. So this is a risk assessment that we have done for Ulster County, so knowing Everything in red is the most common and most dangerous for our county. Yellow is a little bit less, and green is not as common. Um, but yeah, so for the red, so flooding, wildfire, cyber attack, um, hazmat, and severe snowstorm is weather. Those are some of the most major things that we're gonna have the most risk for our county and the most common that we're gonna deal with. The biggest thing is to develop a family emergency plan biggest thing people want to know is how their family, what, what they're doing in their university. Number one thing that goes down during university is communications. You won't be able to call them and you won't be able to get a letter out at all either. So it's going to be very difficult to know what your family is doing, whether they're across the county, across the country, wherever they are. Um, stocking up on your university supplies. So having plenty of it in your home because you could have a disaster happen at any moment. And being aware before, during, or after a disaster. So knowing what happened, when it came, what to do after, it's a big thing. So why do we plan? Disasters can strike quickly and without any warning at all. A lot of storms can just roll in, cause a lot of havoc, and have little to no incoming at all. Including the ice storm that we had last year. Came in, but I know I'm out at Harley as a fire firefighter, and we were had 20 to 30 calls a day with power lines down, uh, trees on houses, stuff like that, to knock down a whole town for days. You can't leave your home, the roads are, you can't get anywhere. So having your enough supplies is very important. Um, you'll be more confident and comfortable if there's an event or a disaster. Um, everyone in your family will know what to do. That's the number one thing as well. If you have your mother, father, children, anyone in your family, making sure that they know what to do and have a plan. Um, you may also be separated and have no way to get in touch with each other. Uh, emergency personnel may be overwhelmed, just like we were in the ice storm, and you may be on your own for a minimum of three days. Does everyone have stuff to last you for three days? Having clothing, food, what? Special, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, making sure you have everything that you need to last you. So, reasons why we don't plan. Procrastination. If there's no storm coming, why do I have to prepare? No reason if I don't see one coming. It could happen any time. It'll never happen to me. Yeah. A lot of us say that all the time. Oh, it'll never have that happen until the day it does. You'll never know when. It could happen any time. Um, unaware of hazards and how to prepare. Fear, overwhelmed, cost involved. No one wants to spend money on something that they think they'll never use. You don't want to buy an overabundance of something. You never have to use it. But it's nice to have it if you do. How to develop a family emergency plan. So meet, meet with your 
your family and discuss what you need to do to plan and prepare. So meeting up with all your family members and just having a plan in place is crucial. Discuss, so discussing the types of events and disasters that we are most likely to occur within our county. So flooding, cyber attack, uh, bio fire, a lot of those. And pick, pick two places to meet, one just outside of your home and one outside of your neighborhood. So if something major happens to your home, you have a place that you can all go to if you're separated to know that you guys are all okay. How to develop an family emergency plan. So one, develop an emergency communication plan. So as I said earlier, both disasters, the number one thing that we knocked out is your communication. It's nothing that you can do to get in touch with them. So being able to communicate is crucial. Ask an out of town relative to pretend, or a friend to be your point of contact. So if someone who's living, let's say in Albany, that person, if they can't get in touch, if family member can't get in touch with you, they can call up to that person who's not in the disaster zone and make sure that they can tell them that they're okay. Um, discuss what to do if authorities ask you to evacuate. If you have a place to go, you have a friend, family who lives out of town, that would be very important. Uh, be familiar with your escape routes. So there could be a tree down, it could be a car accident, it could be ice on the roads. You could not be able to go a certain way that you're used to. Everyone is a creature of habit. It goes the same way to work every day. I know I do. The same way. If a tree goes down, knowing an ulterior route to get to the place that you're going is very important. Uh, plan how to take care of your pets. Um, that's a number one thing as well. A lot of places won't take your pet. And it's, I know a lot of people are, if my pet can't go, I won't go. So knowing where a pet can go and pet friendly is very important. And insurance, fire, flood. Um, it's a payment that you may not think that you need, but you never know when it could happen. You have a storm come in at any moment, and it's very important to have insurance to be able to cover that. Practice to maintain your plan, renewing that plan every six months. Conduct fire and emergency evacuation drills. Uh, test and recharge fire extinguishers yearly testing your smoke alarms monthly. That's a number, we get a lot of smoke detectors that are very, very old when we respond to uh, fire alarm activations for our local fire department. <laughs> and if they have a real scenario, a real fire, it doesn't work, that could put your whole family at risk. And replace, replace stored water and food every six months or at least annually. So having that ready and prepared. Knowing your neighbors. We need to assist each other. So knowing your neighbor who's in a wheelchair by letting that neighbor know uh, you may be in a wheelchair can be a great assistance for the emergency responders that are coming. Uh, we need to have a sense of community and people are caring for each other. So if you know someone who's more at risk than another person, making sure that they know a scenario of what's going on, you be able to keep an eye on them. Um, home fires. In just two minutes, a fire can become life-threatening. In five minutes, a residence can be engulfed in flames. So you don't have much warning if you have a fire go up, could be spreading throughout the whole place very fast. Okay. <laughs> a lot of our calls every year, meat loafers in the oven for too long. You get a lot of that. And knowing how to be prepared and having stuff ready for you is very important. Um, electrical and appliance safety. I know, I think for me, while I'm at college, a lot of people have an adapter an adapter, plug into a fridge, plug into another adapter. Very big fire safety. Um, so yeah, knowing how many amps something can take. Um, what you're be plugging into and making sure you're not overwhelming the electrical grid. Um, portable space heaters, so keeping a safe distance from them. Um, making sure that children stay away as well. Um, you don't want a child to be too close, touch it, could be a hazard for them. So making sure you keep an eye. So a lot of the stuff in your home to you may think it's a normal thing that you're using, but to somebody else, it could be a hazard to them who's unaware. Um, using your fireplace safely, so making sure you do annual cleanouts, keeping up on your chimney and the maintenance of that. Um, making sure that everything's safe and you're uh, making sure your kids, your family, that they're not gonna sit their hands in it, so that's cool. Fire extinguishers, multiple types. So a lot of these are ordinary combustibles, B is flammable liquid, C, live electrical equipment, D, combustible metal, and K, 
pay is commercial cooking equipment. Making sure to know what fire extinguisher to use. So a lot of people try and put water on an electrical fire. It's not gonna work. So making sure you know what you're doing is very important. Home fire statistics. Three out of five home fire deaths result from uh, fires and properties without working smoke alarms. More than one third, 38% of home fires deaths result from fires in which no smoke alarms are present or that they're out of service and too old to be used. Um, the risk of dying in a home fire is cut in half of homes with working smoke alarms. Even if when they go off out of nowhere, in college they do it every day. At 2 a.m. I get sent out of my dorm and have to go in the parking lot to the fire department arrives. I'd much rather do that than the one time they don't set it off and there's an actual fire. Go bags, bug out preparedness kits. Having a go bag ready is very important. So even if you have a spare set of clothes, you're really Yep, yeah, sorry about that. Um, having a go bag is very important. Um, being prepared to make it your own and last at least three days or even possibly longer. And only bringing things that you need. You don't need a whole suitcase. Only a little bag and make sure that you have a spare change of clothing. Um, yep, your crucial medicines. And make it last even longer. You can, if you only have a few pills, you can space them out a few days. So only having enough to last you. Um, identify and collect important supplies as soon as possible. Waiting until an event occurs can be too late and forget something. So having that bag ready is very important. And prepare a smaller go kit for use of rapid evacuation if necessary. So keeping that right by your front door, your apartment door, right by the door so you can easily grab it if something goes wrong. Your bug out supplies, which is first aid kit. Um, you'd want a little bit of gauze, trauma bandage, uh, ACE style bandage, roll waterproof first aid tape, a small package of antiseptic wipes, assorted band-aids, an instant cold pack, a tourniquet, and a bottle of sterile water. So having this ready, just in case yourself or a family member or your neighbor is at risk, making sure you have that. Uh, bug out supply sustainment, something that you can, it's not gonna go bad on you. So an energy bar, ready to eat canned food, non-perishable foods, manual can opener, eating utensils and drinking water supply. You don't wanna bring something in your bag Check it a few months later and it's been completely expired and it's gonna make you sick to eat. Drinking water, how much do you think that you should have? Open up to you guys. If you had the go bag ready, how much water would you have? How much water do you drink in a day? Not enough. Yeah, not enough. <laughs> so recommended, it's one gallon of water per person per day. Not many people that drink one gallon of water per person per day. Um, times 10 days, so 10 gallons of water per person. Almost four and a half cases of water per person. It's a lot of water. So, your bug out supplies of hygiene. So your toothbrush and toothpaste. Um, feminine hygiene products, products, garbage bags. Important gallon size, little plastic bags. 10 day prescription supply, toilet paper, towel, and travel size soap, shampoo, and deodorant. And another thing, in your go bags, you can just use a bar of soap for a lot to cover that. I don't need deodorant in my go bag. This is, it's not essential to me. If I need to have the space or something else, that's gonna be more important. Other people can have me smell bad if I'm gonna make sure that I have enough food or water for a few days. <laughs> your bug out supplies for your tools. Your cell phone charger, which most of the time your communication go down anyway. Have it slipped in, very good. Uh, LED lantern with batteries, uh, two flashlights with batteries, spare batteries is very important. Uh, Multi-tool pliers, a crank of beer emergency radio, uh, duct tape, a local map, waterproof matches, your paper, pencils, and permanent markers. Having a permanent map is crucial because if your phone doesn't work, you can't use GPS, and a lot of people my age never held a map before. And only rely on a cell phone. If they if GPS doesn't work, you can have the road signs go down on the road. They can get lost within a few roads from your house, not even know. So having a local map just to know your routes that you can go and what roads are around you is very important. And customize your kit to fit your individual family needs. You know your child, your father, your mother needs one thing that's very important, making sure that is in your bag. 
UCAR, which is the Ulster County Animal Response Team. So they are a coordinated approach to caring for companion animals as well as people in the event of a disaster or emergency. They have everything ready, so they have dog kennels, cat cages, anything that you can think of. I don't know where they put snakes though. I don't know where they, what they do with them. Pillowcase would really good. Learn how you can be a part of a critical community effort. Please contact UCARD if you're interested. The Tri-County Code. Made up of multiple organizations to assist during a disaster event. So your volunteers, mass feeding and shelter capabilities. Uh, volunteers make up of almost the entirety of a disaster response. The local fire departments, where you respond all day and all night to a local disaster. So. Protect your everyday. So recognize these signs. So express their implied threat, photography, testing or probing of security, and breach or attempted intrusions. So just keep your eyes open. And if you see something, say something. And natural threat evaluation and reporting. So threat evaluation and reporting overview. So knowing what risk of factors are within our county. So what we are at risk of, which was flooding, wildfire, car accidents, um, triggers and stressors, warning behaviors, mitigating factors. So I'm gonna pull up a video for all of you. This part is gonna be more directed about active attackers. Okay. So attacking, uh, an active attacker came into our building. What would you do? So at an active attacker event can be defined as these events are one or more people who are actively engaged in harming or attempting or to harm one or more individuals in a defined or populated area. These events are unpredictable and can evolve quickly. So knowing what to do is very important. So this building follows the four outs. And I'm gonna pull up a video and have you guys all watch the video. Starts up, I would like to let all of you know that this video is all an act. It's just to give you information about what could happen. So none of this is real. This is all staged. It's all an act. So you might see scenarios that might be uncomfortable with. This is just a scenario. And it's all an act. event is something that none of us ever want to imagine happening in a senior living community. But the reality is that all places where people congregate, including senior living communities, are vulnerable, and that vulnerability results in an increased need for preparedness. Hi, I'm Steve Wilder, President of Sorensen Wilder & Associates in Bradley, Illinois. Over the past several years, I've worked with hundreds of senior living and long-term care communities around the country in planning for, responding to, and recovering from active shooter events. The leaders of your organization are taking steps to minimize the chances of an active shooter event occurring in your community. But no matter how hard they are working, there are no guarantees that it will not happen. The fact remains, active shooters have already targeted senior living communities in various parts of the nation. No community, no town, no culture, and no faith is exempt from the risk. And while the chances of it happening in your community are low, it is still of critical importance that you are prepared. The senior living environment presents unique challenges in an armed intruder situation. In most other types of buildings and businesses, all you have to worry about is yourself. 
in a senior living community, the responsibilities are much greater. Not only do you have to think about yourself, you also have to think about protecting the residents, many of whom are not able to take care of themselves. This presents unique problems that need to be considered when developing your plans to respond to this type of event and makes your understanding of what to do critical. The essential goal of your training and preparedness is to minimize the loss of life. Senior living communities strive to be welcoming to family members and resident visitors. Even with controlled access, doors are often unlocked during normal business hours and resident guests and vendors may have access to the community throughout the day and evening. The openness and accessibility of the community environment can make it easier for a dangerous person, an armed intruder, or an active shooter to enter and threaten the safety of the people inside. A shooter in a senior living community is unthinkable. If we hear the sound of gunshots, we think it must be something else. But the first rule of survival is quite simple. If it sounds like gunfire, treat it as gunfire until you know otherwise. We have to be prepared for the worst. We want the sound to be anything but gunfire, but by being prepared for the worst, we improve the chances for survival for ourselves and our residents. With an active shooter in a senior living community, there are four immediate choices, which we refer to as the four outs. Get out, hide out, keep out, and take out. Survival is typically the result of two critical components, having a plan and being prepared. Your plan does not have to be complex. In reality, a simple plan will be easier to remember and to carry out. Get out, the first step for survival, is to identify where the shooter is located in the building in relationship to where you are. This becomes a critical factor when faced with that difficult decision between your personal safety and the safety of your residents and others. The general rule is the farther away the shooter is, the more time you'll have to focus on yourself, your residents, and others. If the shooter is in a different part of the building, your greatest chance for survival may be to get out. If possible, move yourself, your residents, and others out of the building. Leave your belongings behind, but bring a phone with you if it is in your possession. Do not lose valuable time going back to our phone. Focus on getting as many people out as possible. If time allows, announce there is an active shooter in the building. From the moment the first shot is fired, the shooter knows that 911 has been called and that the authorities will arrive quickly. The shooter's goal is to create as many casualties as possible in a short period of time. Make no mistake about it, this will probably be the most scared you will ever be in your life. When moving residents, yourself and others, be as quiet as possible. You do not want to draw attention to yourself, nor do you want the shooter to realize what you are doing. Pre-plan in advance where your emergency exits are and where you are going to relocate to. When you get to a safe location, call 911. Never assume someone else has called. There is no such thing as too many calls to 911. If getting out is not an option, your second choice is to hide out. Hiding out is meant to accomplish one thing, make it difficult for the shooter to locate you. Your objective is to try to hide your residents, yourself, and others in a place where the shooter cannot easily find you. Be familiar with the building's layout and pre-plan the rooms that you can use as a hideout. The shooter will likely be moving quickly, seeking out as many targets of opportunity as possible, knowing the police are on the way. If you are hiding out in an office or a similar type room, turn off lights, lock doors, Place heavy furniture or equipment in front of the door if possible, and move away from the door. Try to make the room look dark and unoccupied. It is highly unlikely that the shooter will take time to try to kick down or shoot through a door, knowing the police are already on their way and time is limited. Silence your cell phone. Turn the vibration mode off as well. Turn down the volume on two-way radio devices. Remain in this room until the threat has ended and recognize leaders of your organization or the police advise you that it is safe to come out. Know in advance what rooms can be locked and incorporate these rooms into your planning and training. And remember, in a senior living community, moving multiple residents into one room that can be secured is a very viable option. An even more challenging situation you may be faced with is how to protect your resident and yourself in a resident room where the doors to the room cannot be locked. This is common in a skilled nursing environment or a memory care unit. In such cases, we add our third element, keep out. Here, in the absence of locks on the doors, you will have to rely almost entirely on the contents of the room 
to secure entry and protect the resident and yourself. You do have a distinct advantage. Resident beds, some of which can weigh several hundred pounds, make an excellent barrier when placed against the door. Lock the wheels and use additional furniture in the room, such as dressers and chairs, to add weight and resistance. We want to use all of the resources available to us to keep the shooter from gaining access to the room. We typically think of heavy articles of furniture, but don't hesitate to use smaller items that can add weight and resistance as well. Along the same lines, when the shooter is in a different part of the building, but getting out is not an option because of medical conditions, mental status, or acuity concerns, you may also consider building a wall of obstruction in front of the emergency fire doors leading into your unit. Fire doors are typically held open by magnetic devices and cannot be locked. Typically one door opens in one direction and the other swings in the opposite direction. By building this wall of obstructions, our intent is not to prevent the door from being open, but to create so many obstacles for the shooter to get past that he will instead move on, seeking out more accessible targets of opportunity. In rare cases, and only as a last resort, when you are unable to move the residents or yourself and are unable to secure the room, you may consider a concept called hiding in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight is accomplished by staying outside of the shooter's vector of sight, even though you may be in the same room. Hidden corners, washrooms, closets, and other recesses in a room might provide a suitable location to hide in plain sight. The shooter, who is moving quickly knowing the police are getting near, looks inside the room for targets of opportunity. Trapped in the room and unable to escape, the associate hides in a corner, trying to stay outside of the shooter's line of vision. As a last resort, and only as a last resort, you may have no choice but to try to take out the shooter. In other words, fight back. When this becomes the case, remember there is no such thing as a fair fight. This is the fight of your life because this is the fight for your life. The intent is to stop the shooter from being able to hurt you or anyone else. Identify weapons of opportunity that you have available to you. Remember, many of the things we use in our day-to-day -day activities can become weapons of opportunity when needed. Fire extinguishers become impact weapons. Pens, scissors, and letter openers become edged weapons. Stethoscopes, telephone cords, trouser belts all become choking weapons. We don't typically think about them like this because that is not their intended use, but this is a life or death situation that requires quick decisions and actions if you are going to survive. When fighting back, Commit to actions of disabling the shooter. There is strength in numbers. The more people you have to help you, the better your chances of survival. Strike the shooter hard, using surprise, aggression, and speed. And don't stop until he has been disabled. It is also important to understand that the first arriving police officers are not there to tend to the injured. Their job is to stop the shooter. Never approach the officers run towards them, or make aggressive moves against them. Once police arrive, exit the building with empty hands, with your hands high and your fingers spread. Even if you know the officers, remain focused on your safety and the safety of your residents and allow the police and the first responders to do their job. An active shooter in a senior living community is unthinkable, but it has happened and has taught us an important lesson. The best way to survive and preserve life is to be prepared. Have a plan and rehearse and practice the plan. Know your surroundings and the exits. Keep your community secure, stay alert, and remember the four outs that can help to keep you and your residents protected. Get out, hide out, keep out, and take out. So, the four outs are very important. Knowing what to do when an active shooter came in is crucial for a place even of this size, knowing what to do. The biggest thing that we want to emphasize is hiding. If you're located in your room, staying there, making sure that you barricade the door to protect yourself. Lock the doors if they are present. Close and lock your windows. Silence your electronic devices and identify anything that can be used as a weapon. 
hiding may be the only option. So if you're in your room, like close the door, barricade it if you can, lock it, and call 911 to let them know of a threat that could be coming. It's better to have more people call for an actual event than have no one call to let them know. Another thing that we could have to emphasize is that if you are in a dining hall or a living room, somewhere that is unable or not your room and you can't lock the door, a staff member will be there to let you know. We don't want you crowding the front desk. We don't want too many people down there as well. If there's an event going on, staff members should know and calling 911 is also very important. We don't want you calling the concession desk first. We want you to call 911. And 911 will let the concession desk know. And we don't want people overcrowding the concession desk because too many people in one area is not a good thing. So if you're located in your room, close and barricade the door. And if you're in a living area, a staff member will direct you to go somewhere. Thank you, and we're gonna open this up to our panel, and we're gonna open it all up to questions. So just one moment, we'll set up, and we'll open up to questions. So we'll go down the line really quick. Um, have everybody introduce themselves, and then you can ask away any questions, and we'll pass around the mic like we normally do. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Rob Shamro. I'm a sergeant with the Ulster County Sheriff's Office. I'm sorry. Is that better? Yeah. My name is Rob Shamro. I'm a sergeant with the Ulster County Sheriff's Office. I've been in law enforcement for the last 30 years, and I'm the assistant team commander of our emergency response team. Which, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's technically our county SWAT team. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rob Lucchese. I'm the chief over at the New Paltz Police Department. Hi, my name is Joseph Decker. Um, I've worked for the Sheriff's Department for a long time, 28 years. Um, kind of, I started corrections uh, and I ended up being involved in uh, exercise and design uh, for things that are, that can potentially happen to be able to do exercises. So I'm part of the team uh, with Cam in regards to coming in and, and looking at your facility and learning about your facility and learning about the people that live here. And it's a great opportunity and it's, it's been, so far it's been awesome, so. Right, we'll go to you first. Uh, a thoughtful active shooter would come in this place at approximately six o'clock in the evening and go directly to the dining hall and simply spray that place. So your only choice, I think, is fight back. And I wondered if you had any specific suggestions in that kind of situation. You would fight back any way you could. I mean, I don't have a specific, a specific situation or a specific uh, set of instructions I can give you. Other than that, you're in, in that scenario. You're either going to successfully stop that individual from inflicting harm, um, or you are going to be seriously injured or killed. So, uh, whatever means you have at your disposal to stop that individual is what you should be doing. If you can't get out. Knowing the structure, you know, knowing that dining hall in particular, if you can get out one of those side doors and the threat is right, is in the hallway, then yes, try and do that. But if you're left with no alternative to fight, you fight with, with, with all your will and, and, and strive to survive. And one thing that I would add too is, you know, look in front of you, look at the tools that you have, right? So you've got plates, you've got cups, you've got water, you've got coffee, you've got our staff. Don't be shy. You just heard on the video that guy just said, the fight that you have at that time is the fight for your life. Don't worry about hurting somebody or doing something in that moment. So we don't want you to necessarily throw yourself under the table and, and hurt yourself trying to like break a hip or something, but 
you know, you're not going to be in there necessarily by yourself. So you've got our staff. Our staff has, have all seen this video. Our staff, you also have to think about too, right? So the people that you refer to as the kids. While all of this concept and the training for active attackers and active shooters is more of a new and unfortunate concept for all of you, these kids have been doing these drills since they were in kindergarten, right? Um, they've all drilled on this since they were little. So these are concepts that they've grown up with just like you probably had different types of drills in school that we've never heard of before. Um, but look around you and look at all the tools that you have right in front of you. I want you to think, what do I have right in front of me that can protect me? I might not have a gun, but if I throw hot coffee at somebody or distract someone, or you, you're gonna have to protect yourselves and others. It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be able to run away or get away, but you're, like the video just said, you're in the fight for your life and maybe your neighbor's lives. In, in terms of personal safety, the only other thing I, I add is, you know, that planning starts before something happens. You know, it, it's not it, it, when it happens. And, and to that degree, um, I know in the presentation, they talked about family planning. So what I would encourage all of you is to make sure, number one, that all of your family contact information is updated with the staff here at Woodland Pond. I would also make sure that those family members um, have the notification systems that have been put into place so that when a crisis arises, they will be notified. Uh, communications is the first thing that breaks down, even for us. You know, we're from multiple, we're from two different agencies, and so even when we arrive, we're not communicating on the same radio system. So that there is some chaos in that initial response, and if your family members have those notification systems on their smartphones or on their telephones, then they'll get that information. Um, and, and, it, and it frees up the staff here at Woodland Pond, and it also ensures that everybody is in the loop as far as information is concerned. Um, I just noticed something on Travis's slideshow. Um, there was one thing missing, and that's to have a go bag for your pets. Um, you need food, you need water roll, you need uh, medicine, uh, you need uh, an extra, if you need a collar or leash, they, those, those things you have to have. And same three days, food-wise. Yeah, definitely. Um, our pets are part of our family, so having a bag ready for them is very important. Thank you. Who's next? Who's next? I'm just curious, how many active shooters have you had in Ulster County in the last, I don't know, 10 years? And what, what, what communities, what types? So in, in the last 10 years, I don't recall any active shooter in Ulster County. Um, we just got, we're discussing, I think the last one was in the city of Kingston at the old um, town of Ulster Mall. And that was about 12 years ago. And prior to that, um, before my arrival at the Sheriff's Office, there was one in the village of New Paltz, um, which I'm not quite familiar with because I was working for the Sheriff's Office at that time. That was in 2001. In the village. In the village. An individual who was engaging with law enforcement uh, with a uh, an assault rifle. Do you, do you actually think that the staff, the amount of staff you that said woman is going to do what happened in that video? It's going to protect the amount of people here. It's going to happen. People have to do for themselves. I noticed that the state police are not involved. Is there a reason for that? The state police, they are involved in regards to our emergency exercise on October 4th. So just rest assured that they are. They're just, the representative wasn't able to be here today. In connection with uh, emergencies, know your neighbor is very important. A few years ago, we had established a policy uh, called the buddy system, where one resident and another resident exchanged information. Each knew where the go bag was. Each knew the contacts. 
Unfortunately, that system has lapsed and I'd like to recommend that we reinstate it. Ross, anyone? Phil, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I would say that if you were back in the dining room, if you were there and an active shooter came in, one of the best things to do would be to tilt the tables over so that they wouldn't be able to shoot you. <laughs> Any other questions? One of the things on your go bag, don't forget your car. I happened to look at my first aid kit in my car and I think the medicine there was one nine eight five. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead. On the news, I don't know if it was the whole United States, but they said on October 4th, I would receive an email as a practice. Is this a coordinated effort on October 4th? No, there's something else going on on October 4th. It's related oh. to which town? Yeah, they're testing the National Emergency Alert System around the 4th. It just happens to be the same day. Yeah, we picked our date first. Yeah, the, that date was picked after the fact, but the two have nothing to do with each other. So when we are going through our drill, you might see that come across. Right. So you might see our alert system, you might see theirs too. Don't confuse the two. I just read, Michelle, that, um, and I'm so pleased that all firearms and ammunition are going to be banned here because that's access for some Looney Tune. So I'm glad that that's going to happen. talking about uh, storms and uh, what you should do. Does Ulster County have evacuation centers? Yes, they do have evacuation centers, shelters that are designed to allow you there throughout the county. Uh, when they're, they're activated, we are notified at a county level and at also at a town level. Uh, so that way we can direct people to those locations and be able to go and get shelter, heat and or cold. Uh, they have warming centers and they have cooling centers during the summertime, so. Well, I just wanted to add one other thing in terms of emergency preparedness in that regard. The staff here at Woodland Pond sits on the New Paltz Emergency Preparedness Committee. So um, New Paltz, in the wake of Hurricane Irene, uh, formed a, with the local emergency preparedness committee and it's comprised of members of the highway department the dpw the police department the fire department woodland pond red cross and so we meet quarterly um, we discuss not just natural or man-made or human-made um, disasters but we talk about natural disasters how we would respond so there is a tremendous amount of coordination and communication and just so you are all aware of that and to be you know maybe a little bit more um, comfortable knowing that, that, that those dialogues are taking place. You all have um, expectations about how we will behave, and I welcome that. We also, in turn, have expectations about how you all will behave. Is there general agreement as to when you wait, as opposed to when you actively go in? What can we expect in terms of an agreed upon consensus by law enforcement to do the right thing? What is that right thing? So I can speak for our agency, um, and I think most agencies are, do this. You can expect us to respond and to come in. Um, if there's an active threat taking place, our initial responding officers are trained to go in and to stop that threat, to search for and stop that threat. So if there are people injured that they encounter while doing so, they will, they will step past them. Their job, the initial responding officers, their job is to stop the threat. End of story. 
and they will not, they're, they're not supposed to stop and do anything differently until they have done that. Um, secondary responding officers may begin to secure an area. They may begin to um, aid, render aid, or pull people out. But you can expect that initial responding officers are going to be looking for that threat. And I'll let Rob address the ESU or the emergency services portion of that. And also, who will be in charge at each incident? There seems to be a lot of you and a lot of agencies. Have you agreed about who's going to be in charge? We would operate off of a unified command system. There's no one individual. Um, as a chief of police here, ultimately, I guess a lot of that would fall on me, but you know, I, I would be, you know, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't include subject matter experts like the emergency services unit. They have a commander that is going to be consulting with us. I'm going to be you know, sitting with my counterparts from the state police, from the sheriff's department, or any other agency that's there, and I'm going to be relying upon their um, their experiences, their expertise in, in terms of decision making. So there is no one decision maker in a scenario like that. There will be um, multiple people sitting in a room looking to see what those best options are, and we're going to defer a lot to the people that are on the ground. This this gentleman here, he is a subject matter expert when, when we're talking about emergency services. I'm not. So for me as a, as a chief of police, I'm going to rely upon him. Yeah, yes, that's very important. Um, we'd be sitting in a vehicle or a, um, a staging area together, and we'd be discussing these tactical ideas and strategies between us, and we'd relay that to our team. Um, unfortunately, our team is, is a part-time team, which I think is a good idea because that allows for a large majority of our patrol officers to be on patrol, and they're actually tactical officers on patrol. So that, that's a good thing that Dulce County provides for us. Um, so that means you have an officer on our team right now currently, and he's two minutes away from this building on a normal day. So that's a good thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, like I said, it's, it's a large county, so in order for my team to get here, you're looking at about an hour to get our whole team here. But the good part of that is, like I said, you have active tactical officers on patrol on a daily basis throughout the county. And no matter what agency they work for in the county, if something kicks off serious like that, they know they have to get here, regardless of what's going on in their county. Is there written information that we can take with us to make a new ball? This just went pretty fast. Yeah, so we can print out the presentation and give a lot of the important information out of it to all of you. Um, everything that we see that is important out of it and give that to you as a handheld copy so you can read over it and have it available to you whenever you need it. Thank you. Yep, yeah, this video is right on YouTube, so you can be able to look up and be able to watch it as many times as you want until you get bored of watching it, but watch it as many times as you want. Uh, some of us here have had training in EMS, nursing, CPR, etc., but I'm assuming during the exercise we shouldn't play games. Is that right? Correct. He's asking if any of you have had CMS, you know, training or CPR training during this drill. We want residents to follow whatever they're telling you to do. All right? Don't stop in the hallway. Keep moving. We don't want to cause confusion, especially for the members that are coming in and dealing with the threat that could be coming. It could cause confusion if someone's trying to help and could be trying to get tools out. We, as they're looking through the building, they aren't sure what they could be pulling out. So their most important thing is to make sure everybody is hidden. I, I have a question. Uh, if there was an emergency situation, uh, is a telephone notice sent out to alert people that there is a situation? Yes, that goes out on our internal system. You will get that. Usually it's a phone call and then a text message depending on what you have set up with the information you've provided with us. So that's why we want to make sure all your information is up to date. If you change your cell phone number, make sure concierge has that right away. So Rob, today they should have received a weather alert. Who did not get a weather alert today? Right, so you should have gotten a weather alert three ways today. Email, cell phone, landline, or text. And your family should have gotten it. So I did family notifications. 
you're not getting that, make sure your information is correct, okay? So just one quick thing, just to add to the, to the last comment, in terms of participation, we, we, we understand you may want to and you have training and experience, but if this was a real life scenario, we wouldn't want you involved in this. You know, we don't want you leaving a safe place to go to an unsafe or an unknown place. If you're in your room and you're safe in your room, we want to keep you in your room. And so for that reason alone, we would not want you to participate in this drill because it's not something we would expect of you in a real life scenario. If we're away from the campus on part of that day, do we come back in the middle of a flurry of fire or just stay away, go to the diner and read a book? Yeah, you're gonna stay away. Things will be corded off so you won't be able to come back. That's why we said in our last director's meeting where there's a lot of hands here that we're not here at the director's meeting. Um, if you have doctor's appointments or need to change them or have to make other arrangements for that day so you can be off campus and stay off campus because when this starts, you're not going to be able to get back in here or be able to get out, okay? There's, I don't think there's any bus trips that day or anything, right? No buses running, so plan ahead. You still have time. October 4th. October 4th. If we're in the swimming pool, should we stay there or try to get out? It really depends on the situation, but yes, I mean, it's, you know, depends where you are. Are you saying, Michelle, that our kids in California and Colorado should be notified and they get every time notice like the weather's going to be bad today? No. Get all this bad today. No, today I'm Today I did it on purpose because I knew we were having this meeting because I want you to timely maybe talk to them and say, did you get a weather notice from Woodland Pond? Because I tested the system. So you can speak to them and see if they're in that alert system. Normally we would only use it for an event that they would need to be notified. So if you had a call from them today and said, why did I get a Woodland Pond weather alert? It was because I knew we were gonna be having this meeting and I wanted to see if they were loaded into that system. So if you want them to be on the family notification system, normally it would only be used for things that would be like a real family notification emergency. But today I used them on the weather one just as a test to see if they were on there. Yeah, so you would have to make that decision of whether you want them on the family alert. During the drill, if someone's walking a dog, can I let them come in my back door? That's up to you. Okay, because I'm on the ground floor. Yeah, unless they have guns. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to comment on that as well. That's all about knowing your neighbors. Um, if you know the person and making sure that they get to a safe place, if you're unable to get out, get away, it could be a threat. If you know your neighbor, you could let them in and both stay together and keep an eye on each other. So, thank you. Okay, so I'm the neighbor outside her door with my dog and the drill starts. What happens? Well, in your case, I'm a do I'm a, I have a dog and we're outside and the drill starts. What happens? What do I do? Yeah. So your dog, so your dog is specific because I don't know who your dog can go around. That's absolutely correct. Right, so you have to know which neighbor you can but can I, I can't come back in the building, right? And I, I can't leave uh, the campus and get in my car. So I'm curious what I would do for four hours. You can go to a neighbor. It really depends on the scenario. You know, if you're out by a cottage, when you know what's going off, you get the alert. That cottage doesn't have any animals, knock on that door if you know that person. You know, it depends, yeah, it depends where you are, you know. <clears throat> also, relative to getting back in during the drill or any other emergency event, we're in the process of installing, and they'll be done in a day or two, some panic buttons underneath 
the desk at reception and concierge. So that if something happens, like if the incoming active shooter, you know, is, is so rude as to not introduce himself and allow us time, um, the concierge or reception can push the button and that button instantly notifies 911 and we have a lockdown situation. It also closes all the fire doors throughout the entire complex. It doesn't alert the fire department, doesn't, doesn't send the fire alarm, it just closes the fire doors to allow for you know, some more wrinkles in that person progressing through the building. The other thing it does instantly is it disables all the badge swipes of all the exterior doors. So you could be outside, you have your badge, but you're not going to get back into that door. The only badges that are going to work that, those exterior doors, are the badges that we've already given to law enforcement. So that, that way, once that button is pushed, no more, you know, nobody else is coming in other than these gentlemen. Um, so going, you know, so even that day, that button will be working by then. Um, so the doors will all be, you know, they're not gonna lock, you can still get out, but the, but the badge swipes won't get you in. And, and if I could add, in, in a real life situation, we would be working with Michelle and Tom and Cameron to identify a relocation uh, place for any resident that was outside. You know, if, if we, we undoubtedly would encounter people out there, we're not gonna have them brought back into the building, but once we identify who they are, we would look to have some sort of um, relocation area where we could safely house you while we are dealing with the situation at hand. So. That in a real life scenario, that is something that's going to be talked about in the command post. Is this training going to happen with the residents of the health center? So exercises can't apply. I mean, this training we had today. Exercise October 4th. We don't know that. We don't know the scenario. The power might be out. And also, you definitely, we would try to have you avoid going in elevators. That's a, I think that was up in the slideshow as well. I uh, apologize. Um, but doing a staircase, or okay, if you end up in an elevator, it could be even more of a threat to you because you don't know. You could open up the door on the bottom floor, and the shooter or whoever, the aggressor, could be right there. So either having a staircase, you could hear someone coming, or just mainly staying in your room, and wherever you are, just hiding in place, that would be very important. Thank you. Can I ask you guys a question? Why do you think we're doing the exercise? To prepare you. And whom else do you think is gonna prepare you? Yeah, right? And the same thing with the with pawn staff. So we have a really good relationship now where through this training that we're gonna go through, we all are gonna go through, and we're gonna see some things that didn't work so well, some things that worked really well, and some things we can improve on. And I think it's, it's all about safety, it's all about all of us in this room, how we're gonna go and protect each other, protect ourselves, and we're gonna go and with this training, we're gonna test some of your procedures and to see how they work. And we might sit there and say, yeah, that's not gonna work. And we're gonna figure that out. Again, when we go through exercise and design and training, it's all about going through a process of, let's do an exercise, we're gonna, and part of the exercise is this training, this initial training. And we talked about this, what, six months ago? And I think. And we thought about a training aspect of it, and we thought it was really important that we get some of you guys to come in and just listen to some of this stuff. Some of this stuff did not pertain to you because you live here. But for some of you, you might go home uh, to a loved one or to a son or a daughter or a, a relative, and you all of a sudden you find yourselves down in Florida, somebody who's from Florida. You know, do you have a, to go back down there? God forbid something. So again, it's all about training, it's all about things that we think about, uh, and what can we do to help ourselves, God forbid something happens, how, how are we gonna deal with that? 
So I think it's really important that we, as a group, we look at this exercise and this development going through and, and, and think of the positive things that are gonna come out of it. Don't sit there and think about the negative and oh, I was inconvenienced. Well, it is an inconvenience. When something bad happens, it's an inconvenience for everyone. And, but we wanna work through it and we wanna learn from it. And I think that's very important. I've worked with some of these individuals in the front for a long time. Uh, and it's such an honor to, to be able to come and uh, be a part of this and to learn and to work with other people that I've never worked with before and see how these plans are going to work. Uh, many of the doors to the deck are locked from outside and residents need a key to get out to the deck. This system has been flawed, where residents have died from smoke inhalation because they could not find a key to exit, and the doors were locked from outside. So you have access from outside, but not from inside. You're talking, you're talking about the porches? Yes. No, not here. Yes. Well, you're on an upper floor. No, I know. You can lock it from outside, and you need a key to get out. You can't find a key. So, so what you're telling me is your lock key is on the inside of the apartment, and it's accessible through the outside? You need a key to exit because the doors are locked from outside, from in the porch. And to get out, you We'll have somebody look at your porch. We'll have somebody look at that. When I first moved in, that was a concern for me because my grandchildren were little and they would lock themselves on the porch. And I had the key is on the porch side. I had, I had the whole lock reversed. The first year I was here, it was very easy. You can get in the bed, out from the whole place. I just want to know if the normal activities that we attend on a weekly basis, daily basis, are still going to be uh, active. Yeah, yeah still be active okay. once that drill starts. So, yeah. uh, so bridge is going to stop. Okay. <laughs> so, we if we're on the ground floor, ground level, do we need to barricade or? glass doors, or do we just sit inside and say, okay, I'm safe? <laughs> it all depends on each scenario. So it all depends on, you know, what's happening, where it's happening, what's going on. But just barricade yourself on both sides. We don't expect you to sit on your porch during this drill and wait it out. You know, don't do that. You know, go through the scenario like you would if this was really happening. You know, put yourself out of sight, out of line sight, like the video says. You don't want to be sitting on that glass porch where people can look in if they're walking outside or walking by. You want to be out of sight. I'd like to comment on that as well. Um, the door may be glass, but putting anything in front of the door may divert an attacker. So they want to move through the building as fast as possible because as soon as, as the video said, the first whatever happens, the police are called and they want to move through the building as fast as possible. Anything that could be in the way could protect your life. Whether it be you put something in the way that they have to move and they might say, I don't want to move that. That could save you from them trying to come in instead of an open door. So. I have a question about October 4th. Uh, what hours is this event going to take place? <laughs> it's top secret. We're not going to tell you. That's why we said be prepared. Is Tom trying to get information out of you? Because he doesn't know either. That was a nice try in that. Did I understand you to say we cannot get in our cars and leave? Correct. Once the drill starts. Why is that? Not just the building, but the entire campus. Campus, roads, all that stuff. 
How long is this going to last that we have to be barricaded wherever we are? It all depends on the scenario and what's happening, which you're not a trusted agent, so we can't tell you. And that's all about being prepared. It's about having something in your room, wherever you are, to be prepared. <laughs> Yep. Children in grade school, high school, have been going through this practice for years. Can you tell a little bit about that? I could, but I would rather defer to one of the people at the front. I was waiting for that. Yeah, so I did so. go through them. I, it was after me or before me. What do, what do kids do in the schools? What are their drills like? What are the lockdown drills like in schools? Um, so I know for me personally, almost every single year of school I've gone through, we've gone through one of these drills. Right since I was a kid, and I something I've always been familiar with since we've done it for so long. Um, it's kind of similar to the video of turn the lights out, lock the doors, and sit in silence. And as a kid, of course, all we want to do is talk to each other. And teachers advise us, don't don't talk to you, each other. You have to stay quiet. This is a real scenario that we're. It's only a drill, but you need to treat it as a real scenario. So I know ever since I was in, as long as I can remember, uh, doing drills similar to this, and no, now I know very well what I should be doing during that. Um, but yeah, I've done it every year. So closing the doors, locking them if we can, locking the door with desk, uh, chairs, anything we can find, and staying silent in the back of the room in a corner that's hidden. So. Yeah, and that's the same thing my kids have described is it's silence is the most important thing. And uh, shutting off the lights and locking the doors. So that's gonna be really important for all of you because I know all of you. And all of you are gonna say, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's she saying? What's she saying? What's she saying? What's she saying? Right? So don't do that. <laughs> that's going to draw attention. You've got to shut the lights off, close the doors, and be as quiet as possible. If you have a corner like this, you want to suck yourself into the corner so that nobody sees you. You want to make it look like there's nobody in the room. Okay? It's going to want to be as quiet as possible. You want people to pass by you. Very important. I think you touched on this. The more people that call 911, the better. Do not call concierge. Do not call concierge. This is not just for this drill. This is for whenever the alarm goes off. The worst thing you can do is call concierge because the people at concierge have to be able to call these gentlemen and their counterparts at Ulster County 911 and other emergency services. They need to be able to call Tom. They need to be able to call me. Please do not call concierge when the fire alarm goes off. At the same time that you're wanting to call concierge, we are needing to get ourselves calling you on the notification system that called you today about the weather. The way we do that is through the phones. So please don't call concierge and ask what's happening. Please also do not come to concierge. That staff has to be, you know, doing other things. So those two things shouldn't be happening. All right, any last final questions? This is more of a prevention question. As we all know, many of the shooters are have severe or significant mental health problems. Uh, I'm curious as to what extent in Ulster County you interact with or work with those who are dealing with mental health problems and how, how that might play out in terms of keeping those people away from firearms and being aware of uh, conditions that uh, might prevail with those individuals. So there's, that happens daily in terms of our interaction with people who are in mental health or substance abuse crisis. Um, we're seeing more and more of those types of calls every day. Um, what I'll say is in terms of communication on a county level, there is tremendous communication coordination between the 18 police agencies that exist in this county. So the emergency service unit is made up of members from those various police agencies. The detective, there's the detectives association that meets on a monthly basis. There's a chiefs of police association that meets on a monthly basis. There is a Ulster County school safety meeting, which is comprised of superintendents or district officials 
and law enforcement executives that meets on a monthly basis. In terms of you know, your specific question about access to weapons, the New York State passed uh, an extreme risk protection or red flag law years ago and made modifications to that uh, last year requiring that law enforcement uh, agencies must file an extreme risk protection order if an individual is deemed to be uh, a danger to themselves or others. That's something that we do. I know the Sheriff's Department does it as well. I don't know if that answered your question, though. I would like to ask why you have a specific date. Are you going to get a true reading on how we react to this threat? Wouldn't it be better to give us a three-day span and at some point? No, we have to figure the deal plan. This is just the first drill of many. Oh, okay. Okay, okay again, if, if, if we, we are in an activity, we just shelter, shelter in place that floor. We, we don't, don't try to get back to our apartments. apartments. No. We, we just don't have that the situation. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for all your support coming and discussing this situation. Uh, yeah, we want to thank you guys as well. We're really appreciative of the opportunity, all the community, the staff members as well. We're really appreciative of what you guys are doing for us, having this opportunity. Everybody who's joining me at this table as well. I'm very thankful for all of you guys being here as well. And yeah, we're very excited to be able to train and prepare everybody for not only this, but for the future. To take this with you, share it with your family, your neighbors, whoever you can think of, and share this opportunity with other people. So, thank you as well. And I would like to second that. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Very much.